The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. From Studio 27 in Sacramento, California, and from our guest speaker, Mike Stewart in Atlanta, Georgia, welcome to today's webinar, How to Deliver Quality Audio for Your Webinars, hosted by WebAttract, your end-to-end -end solution provider for webinar demand creation. Hi, I'm Mike Agron, a co-principal and the executive webinar producer with WebAttract. And along with our special guest, Mike Stewart, also known as the Internet Audio Guy, I'll be one of your hosts for today's session. For those of you that may not be familiar with WebAttract, I'd like to put what we do in context because we're much more than just a platform provider. In fact, what we do is we work with organizations and online media publishers who see the business value in using webinars to help them create demand, boost their thought leadership, and brand, and would like to outsource the management of all the logistics involved in putting a webinar together. That would include audience recruitment, to content development, coaching presenters, hosting the webinar, and beyond that want to collaborate with a full services firm such as ours. As you can see, we have a diverse audience representing a lot of different states and provinces and industry segments. But we believe, regardless of your industry segment, your role or experience level, you're bound to get something of value today, and that's our goal, is to make sure that you leave this webinar with something new that you didn't know or validate some ideas before you attended. So Mike and I are going to cover off as best we can on each one of these topics here and make sure that you're able to walk away with new tips and tricks and insights on everything from how to deliver quality audio to the human factor issues and the 10 best practices for producing high quality webinars where audio is an absolute critical outcome. So moving right into our topic today, you know, in doing webinars, as I mentioned earlier, one of the things we found is that really the Achilles heel of all webinars seems to be audio for whatever reason. And it seems from a lot of your responses and what you wanted to learn, you've had similar challenges. So I asked my co-principal, Brett Smith, to do a Google search. There must be somebody out there who's really, really an expert in Internet audio. And lo and behold, he came back with this gentleman by the name of Mike Stewart, and not only is he an expert, he wrote the book on Internet audio, and we're absolutely delighted to have him with us today. And we've been blown away by what he's been able to do to help us at WebAttract create better audio and better webinars. His company, SoundPages, provides custom equipment, software, and support to business owners who want the best in Internet audio and really want to create their own voice information products. He has a background as an audio engineer, He's also composed a lot of jingles uh, for TV and radio, and he's worked with such famous musicians as the Shirelles, Isaac Hayes, Tommy Rowe, Joe, Joe South, etc. has a real passion not only for music and audio, but Internet audio. Mike, I want to welcome you uh, personally to today's webinar, and, and please come on and say hello to the audience. Thank you, Mike, so much. I really appreciate it, and I'm excited to share uh, my experience about Internet audio with the folks here today. Well, terrific. Let's get started. And I want to focus first on the human factors. And both you and I have quite a bit to say about this. And then we're going to get into the technology factors, some of the best practices, and everything we covered uh, that the folks want to learn. One of the most interesting things about webinars is that we're in a virtual situation, a virtual setting. We do not have the same elements that we have in a face-to-face -face communication experience. And maybe some of you have heard of a study called the Moravian Study. This was done in 1967, and Albert Moravian is, is a psychologist out of UCLA, and he did a couple studies, and fascinating reading, and I'd encourage you to, uh, to, to, to Google him and, and come up and, and read his studies. But what he said was that there are three factors that create connection with an audience. One is the words or the content, two is the tone of the voice, and three is the nonverbal behavior. So if you think about it for a second, if I tell you I'm really happy to be here, but my arms are crossed or I have a frown, it's not going to connect. It's not going to have the believability. In a live audience, those three factors are what come into play. And in fact, based on his study, as important as content is, and let's face it, content is extremely important, as far as connecting with an audience, his study showed that the content counts for 
The tone of the voice counts for 38%, and your nonverbal expressions are 55%. Pretty interesting. Now, when you take that to audio only, there's a gentleman by the name of Bert Decker, and maybe some of you are familiar with him. He's a nationally known communications and speech consultant. Actually wrote a book called You've Got to Be Believed to Be Heard, which is all about connecting with audiences. And what Bert says is that in an audio-only situation, the content, as important as it is, is only 15%. The tone of your voice is 85%. Now, whether these numbers are 80% or 75%, the point is how you sound and how you connect with your audience has everything to do with the webinar quality. So if we want to take from the human factors and move into some more human factors about how to work with a microphone, Mike, I want you to take this section here and talk to us about what's important to know. Well, one of the things that I recognize, Mike, about webinars and Internet audio, it is so akin to broadcast and recording. Uh, a webinar to me is like uh, an individual television broadcast because you've got a visual and you've got an audio. And so we, we look at it as computers, we look at it as uh, 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 information delivery, but the truth is you, if you want to have effective audio, the human factor that has nothing to do with the electronics, the equipment, the, the computer connections, all the other things we're going to talk about, it is about you have to become a broadcaster to improve your quality. And you have to think like a broadcaster. Uh, when people are doing, when radio was uh, first invented, uh, to get across messages, you had to use the tone of the voice. The inflections of your voice, the way you said things, uh, the way you delivered your message with the inflections of enthusiasm, uh, uh, concern, there's so many emotions you can convey with just inflections and tone of voice. And especially when you get into uh, information that is uh, going to be related to a sales performance, you want to have excitement and enthusiasm. And so one of the techniques that we used to do when we recorded narrations uh, for commercial purposes or we recorded narrations uh, for uh, uh, voiceover for video, e any application of recorded human voice, the person who was performing it would force themselves to smile. When you're smiling, uh, you sound different than when you're not smiling. It, you're using muscles of the face that will affect the tonality of your voice, and it will convey a positive and more uh, 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 believable uh, inflection to your voice. So number one, these are little human factors that broadcasters, uh, narrators, uh, people who uh, know how to convey and, and project their voice professionally, if you do a little bit of this, not a whole lot, but just think about these things when you're presenting in a webinar situation, you're going to get a far more uh, effective and more powerful presentation. And then number one, uh, staying close to the microphone. The reason we have that here is that you and I both are on professional microphones. And when you turn your head away from a microphone, just like I did there, you have a huge difference in the sound. So learning to be emotional, uh, uh, enthusiastic, uh, emphatic, all these type of, of important emotions and, and sounds to emit with the inflections of your voice, you must stay close to the microphone. You can't move around. If you watch a broadcaster on a uh, television show, radio sh pro, um, uh, host, you'll notice he never leaves the microphone. He stays within one or two inches of it. And that's what we used to call working a microphone. Because one of the things that you want to do is, is get comfortable having a, a, a an emphatic and uh, confident voice, but if you know that you're going to really get excited, you can back away from the microphone. That's learning how to move in and out. Watch singers who, when they really hit a high note, they'll move the microphone away from them, but when they're getting very intimate and close to the microphone, they can change the tone of the voice, and that's called working a microphone. So these, these little steps right here, you and I both agree, can't hurt because when you're doing a webinar, you are a broadcaster, and these are the things that broadcasters and actors and singers all think about when they're using microphones to convey their, their emotions and their uh, effectiveness of their message. Well, and I think what's important is that what it's really about at the end of the day is connection, not perfection. Uh, you know, if, if we make mistakes when we speak or if there's glitches, that's fine, but it's being able to connect with your audience. And the point of the earlier slide on uh, how audiences react to your ability to connect with them. 
really it's connection. As long as you're connecting, and the best way to connect is for them to hear you, which is why we have, we have said that what you don't know about uh, audio quality on a webinar can be deafening to your audiences. It can make an absolute uh, uh, difference. In fact, we're going to show that in just a moment on how important the different devices are. So I want to move into talking about some ways of delivering quality audio. And Mike, let's start with a little review of what's the difference between consumer and professional audio. So I'll let you take this one. Well, the system we're using here is just GoToWebinar, uh, and it's an incredibly powerful broadcasting system. It's a recording system, and it's a delivery system. But as far as the quality of the audio, what they don't have control over is how you connect your sound. The visuals is basically showing what's on your screen. That's what we're seeing. We're seeing Mike's screen in California, and every one of us all over uh, are being able to see that simultaneously. So that's the visual. But the audio is going to be connected in one of two ways. One, using uh, telephone lines, a landline is best, uh, or using some sort of computer microphone system. And so the, the telephone, is the, to me, is the lowest common denominator. Telephones were never designed to be recording devices. They were designed to broadcast intelligent conversations over telephone lines for long distances. And it's been around for 100, you know, 100 years, the telephone technology. Uh, it is not fidelity recording. Uh, there's what's called frequency response, which means when people can tell what it sounds like when it's on a telephone. It's because there are pieces of the sound that are missing because the telephone system cannot deliver that fidelity of audio. So the next level up that GoToWebinar said, well, you know, to improve the audio quality, and also one of the things that's interesting, when I started doing webinars with GoToWebinar, they didn't have the VOIP, the voice over IP ability to send audio through the internet. And the word webinar had the connotation that the sound would come through people's computer speakers. And back then it didn't. You, you had to use the telephone to deliver your audio. All you could deliver through the GoToWebinar uh, uh, function was telephone audio synchronized with the visuals on the screen. And, and, you know, I've branded myself as the audio guy, and I got a comment at the end of the webinar, some audio guy. I watched the whole webinar, there was no sound. And <laughs> that's because he didn't under, he thought webinar meant the sound should come through the speaker. So it was real exciting when GoToWebinar and Citrix said, hey, you can do either or. People can call in with the telephone if they want to. However, you can use a computer microphone. And it, what you're looking there on the screen are two computer microphone, really affordable systems. Uh, and one of the most common things that happened about five years ago was the ability to have a headset microphone plug into the USB port of your computer. Now, that's still considered a consumer headset microphone. You can find them at office supply places for $30 to $50, you know, in that price range. A lot of different manufacturers. However, when the USB microphone became uh, very popular uh, as a recording system, the professional microphone uh, manufacturers said, oh my goodness, there are people out there in pro audio that would like the convenience of connecting a pro audio microphone as simply as a consumer mic does. And so about four years ago, three, four years ago, uh, was the advent of the USB micro, professional microphone. Now the big differences is number one, uh, there is a large diaphragm in that center microphone. That is the Audio Technica 2020. That's one of many, but that's the microphone that I recommended to Mike. That's what I'm speaking on right now. It's a high quality professional microphone, and it is what's called a, a large diaphragm microphone. That's what's used in recording studios, radio stations, and has been used in recording process for many, many years. A large diaphragm microphone was probably invented in the 20s and hasn't changed a whole lot uh, from its function. That's why even 50, 60-year-old microphones still sound great. But what happened was is that because of this consumer microphone that would improve the audio to your computer, it still has such a small diaphragm in it that there's no way it can compare. It's, not, it's considered what we call consumer audio quality. And, the, and it doesn't have the electronics built into it to sound as good as the electronics that takes the, the, the natural sound waves that are spoken into the microphone and converts them to something that the computer can understand, go to webinar can understand. And it, basically it's taking natural sound and turning it into digital information, zeros and ones per se. And that's what comes out of that USB cable. So basically pro audio 
can be done as easily as consumer audio and and those are the three levels and what I'm recommending if you you know if you start with inferior um, audio input you you just you know you lose the opportunity no matter how many of the other factors are great this is the starting point the starting point of great audio is for about hundred and thirty dollars you can have a high quality professional studio large diaphragm microphone and why not go a little bit extra and use the pro mic versus the consumer so that's the, that's the big differences the electronics can't compare the diaphragm is smaller in the consumer telephone audio is telephone in fact why don't you show them the difference between te uh, telephone audio and studio audio, Mike. All right, I'm going to do that, folks. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to mute the uh, USB microphone, which is actually the center microphone there that I'm using. I'm going to pick up a handset, and let's see if, if people can hear the difference. So give me a second to mute. Now, Mike is going to be talking on the telephone to let you hear the difference between phone audio or consumer audio versus pro audio. Hi, I'm now using a uh, telephone uh, handset here. How does this sound? Sounds like you're on the telephone, Mike. <laughs> right. So there's, a, there's an obvious difference uh, between this. And, and what, what I would say to our, the folks in our audience is that we used to think that because of some of the issues with, with VOIP, that landline would be the safest way to go. We're going to uh, move in just a moment to talk about how you can get good quality Internet audio. And I think, um, actually, uh, Nancy asked a question, uh, how much better is the telephone audio than the computer audio? Hopefully. Uh, Nancy, this gives you an idea of what some of the differences between the two. So, Mike, I'm, I'm going to uh, hit the next slide and let you talk about how easy it is to set this up and then talk a little bit about some of the uh, ergonomic factors with using a scissor boom and a pop filter, and I'll join you back on with my USB. Okay, excellent. And, in fact, we did have a question here that I saw popped up that I'm going to be answering right here in this slide. Um, you, the, the USB microphones eliminated the need for an external sound card. Basically, the audio sound card technically is built into the microphone. So all you have to do to make this work with GoToWebinar is when you have a microphone, a USB microphone, whether it's a headset or one of these studio microphones, is you plug the USB port into your computer. The PC, in fact, the software that the PC recognize installs itself is built right in the microphone. There's no extra software. Basically, you plug it in the microphone, wait a couple of minutes, it says your microphone is now ready to use. And once it's plugged in that computer, it is an option to be able to use that microphone versus what came with the computer. So the setup is plug it in, wait, wait for the uh, acceptance command, and then it works. So you uh, go into uh, an audio set it, setup area and go to webinar and choose that microphone for your audio and you're, you're good to go. Now, a couple of things that are used in radio uh, is what's called a scissor boom. And you're seeing a picture of there on the right. Basically, that's what Mike and I are using right now. That way I'm comfortably in my chair, but I can swing this microphone right in front of my, you know, in front of my face so that I'm talking into the side of the microphone. But if you see that little thing uh, that looks like a big, wide uh, little screen, uh, that's what's called a pop filter. And the reason we have pop filters on microphones in studios and radio stations is that when you say consonants like P, the letter P, the letter D, the letter B, words that begin with those consonants, you, there is a burst of air that comes out of, your, uh, out of your speaking voice that's natural to the way you have to say those consonants. And that burst of air, when it hits the diaphragm of a microphone, will create a loud, distorting thud sound, which it's just, it's not the end of the world, but it does, those are things that you want to avoid uh, when you're recording and the things you want to avoid when you're doing a broadcast. So in recording studios and in radio stations, you'll see um, wind screens, pop filters. These are devices to catch those bursts of wind that, that come from your speaking voice and protect the diaphragm from distorting. So a scissor boom makes it easy to position the microphone anywhere in your chair. I'm sitting in that chair that you see right there. I, I get in front of the microphone. I sp I don't have my hands are able to move free, so I can get uh, you know I can use my hands to to show emphasis and enthusiasm. And the pop filter uh, filters those pops. So are you back, Mike? I'm back, absolutely. And uh, I want to move into uh, a little bit more on technology 101. But we have a question that the question is: Is it correct with a pro microphone? You also need a good headset. Uh, so that it doesn't pick up feedback from the computer speakers. You're able to play back on your computer's sound card the audio. In fact, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just using a regular set of headphones so that I don't get any feedback. But lots of times, 
uh, if you keep your speakers low enough, you won't get the feedback or the echoes. But in today, since this whole webinar is about uh, quality audio, I am using uh, a good pair of headphones, and I plug them into the headphone jack on my computer. So basically, my computer is using two sound cards, the sound card and the microphone to transmit the audio, but the sound card that was built in the computer with headphones is letting me hear what Mike and, and all the other participants are saying on this webinar. So it's very easy to set these things up, and when you do use headphones, you're not going to get any uh, echoes or loop feedback loops. Great. So let's jump into a little bit on uh, what folks need to know about computers, whether you're a PC or a Mac user, and then uh, let's move into talking a little bit about what they need to know about the Internet until we get to some other best practices. And, and, and I think, you know, the, the message here is that get the maximum RAM and processor speed you can afford. Don't skimp. Uh, you just never know when this is going to come in handy. And if you are a user of GoToWebinar or GoToMeeting, and I'm not sure if uh, WebEx operates this way, a, a Mac is fine to use, but a Mac at, at this point does not allow you to do recording. So there are some limitations. And what's important is that probably the most important thing from a system requirement is your Internet connection. And again, um, I'm going to let Mike talk to, to what's important about a uh, fast Internet connection and what are some of the recommended speeds and why, why this helps in, ensure that you're going to have the best audio and video. So, Mike, I'll let you take this one. Well, you know, the, the Internet is not a perfect world. There's so many variables about connecting from what you send people. We're sending sound and picture to the world. We're transmitting. And we're also receiving sound and picture at the same time. So we've got it going both directions. And when it comes to the Internet, uh, and you have an Internet provider, whether it's a cable modem, DSL, T1 line, all the different flavors of Internet connections, you definitely want to be, when you're doing webinars, be on a hardwire connection. Don't do webinars on a wireless connection, because now you've added another element of, of something that can have a dropout or a loss of connection. And when you have a loss of connection, no matter where it is, you're going to have a loss in audio quality, you're going to have a loss in what you see visually. So you want to use hardware connections, and you want to test and make sure that you have the Citrix minimum speeds, because you can have the best microphone in the world, you can do the best human practices in the world, you can do everything right, and if you've got a poor, a poor Internet connection speed, or something that, it, you know, like uh, three or four kids in the house <laughs> playing uh, video games, robbing your bandwidth uh, or your connection speeds, you've got to make sure. In fact, I told my wife uh, to be sure to stay off this computer network because uh, I don't want her checking email or doing, downloading files because that takes away connection speed that I need. I need all the horsepower I can get to guarantee that, that everything works properly. And so even though the hardware is right, the computer is new, the computer is fast, if that connection speed is not as stable and as powerful, you want more connection speed than is needed. And so um, uh, uh, Citrix requires a download speed of at least 2 megabits and an upload speed of at least 1 megabit. And the only way you're going to know that is test that connection. And we, and we can show that, I believe, here soon of how you tested your connection. Yeah, that's a good point. There's, there's lots of free speed tests available. And, and for the folks in the audience, the requirements for browsers, you should be running the latest browser that either Firefox has or, or Google for Chrome has or Internet Explorer, uh, those, those are given. We're just trying to illustrate that those are some of the components that you need. But when it comes to actually testing your speeds, uh, there's speedtest.net, there's speakeasy.net. I've put the uh, links up here uh, for you to try them. And I actually did a speed test uh, in the studio where I am right now. My download is 22 uh, megabits. My upload is 3.3 oh, megabits, safely above the margins of errors. And as Mike said, you just never know if there's going to be a load on this or not. Comcast Cable is our provider. You just never know what's going to happen. So these are good tests for you to run. And the, and the point of this is when you get done with this webinar, run a speed test. See where you're at. You, you might be surprised. You might be very comfortably safe with the speed, or you might need to make some improvements. And one little piece about the speed test, uh, you know, I've actually had some people, you know, they think that, that you know, it's, it's your fault producing a webinar that there's a connection speed. It may be their connection speed is so poor that they can't receive what you're transmitting. You so, know, uh, no, I was going to say, ahead. I'm glad you brought that up because 
uh, in, the, in the hundreds of webinars we do, invariably there's going to be a handful of people, um, and I mean a handful, less than on one hand, who will say they have an echo or they can't hear, and it's very difficult to say it's you. It, everything else is fine. So this is to those of you in the audience that are actually producing and delivering webinars, sometimes it could be on their end, but it's, it, it's obviously a sensitive subject. But let's move into some of the environmental considerations on the importance of a quiet, dead room mic. Um, a microphone is like your ears. So, you know, one of the things that when you're, you, when, if you're a broadcaster, you would never go into a radio station or a recording studio where there's lots of external noises. You've got to control the sound of the room. And, uh, you know, most home offices, I'm down in a basement office. This is a finished basement, and it's quiet down here. We're basically underground, so there's no traffic noise. There's no outside noises. There's no, um, uh, you know, other extraneous sounds that would give the illusion of not being a professional recording. Being close to the microphone makes a big difference. So you want to control the ambience of your, of your room. And what ambience means is, is, is that there's lots of hard surfaces in your, in your room, then you will get a lot of reflections that make your, make your voice sound echoey. So, for instance, if you were in a, uh, an unfurnished hardwood floor room, you would hear lots of echoes, whereas if there were drapes and, and rugs and furniture, those are what's called uh, sound absorbent materials, foam, uh, foam rubber, uh, burlap, there's all kinds of materials that we used to use. And in fact, if you search Google for uh, sonic foam, there's a company called RLX and there's Sonix. These are all types of materials that will absorb sounds and minimize the reverberations. Whereas if you have these hard surfaces like a hardwood floor, basement with a concrete floor, and, you know, and brick walls, things like that, you're going to hear echoes and reverberations. And you don't want a microphone hearing it. If you can hear it, it will... Um, it will get recorded and it will make an inferior uh, webinar for you because you, if you go into a recording studio or radio station, they're going to use uh, materials like sonic foam and, and the carpet and curtains and all those other materials to uh, break, you know, to, to uh, minimize the reverberations and create what's called a dead room, a room without uh, re reverberant reflections of sound. And then, of course, you said you wanted to talk about the air conditioning and traffic and dog. Yeah, I, I think this is important. Uh, you know, you just kind of touched on it that what, what you can hear your microphone hears. If you do webinars and you're not doing them from a room that is quiet and that has a lot of the considerations that Mike talked about, be careful for such things as air conditioners going off, uh, traffic dogs barking, birds chirping, the gardener's weed whacker. I mean, there's all sorts of things, or your cell phone going off, or, or you name it. There's all sorts of things that can go off that can interrupt a webinar, and I think that's another important thing uh, to, to take into consideration. We've got a couple more topics uh, before we get into the best practices and start taking some questions, and we, we've got a lot of questions that have come in, Mike, so I want to I make sure we have time for that. You know, one of the things about doing a webinar is it, it in many ways is the gift that keeps on giving because it has a shelf life beyond the actual live date. And there's tremendous opportunity to take that recording and edit it, take sound bites out of it, distribute it, and repurpose it and reuse it. And so just a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, if you're using GoToWebinar or GoToMeeting, they have a built-in capability to be able to record in real time from your hosting platform, just as we're doing now. It's pretty simple to use. And if you look at the right-hand side of the screen, there's certain considerations you need to know. Uh, are you using your own audio service? Are you using their service? And what's important is, if in, in the bottom part, are you using their format to record in, or are you recording in a Windows Media Player file? And that's important because you are ultimately going to have to re-encode the recording. And what I mean by that is when we're done with this recording, we want to edit it, we want to airbrush some things out. So we have to use freeware from Microsoft. It's called Microsoft Media Encoder. There's the uh, URL for it down there. All you have to do is go to Microsoft site and you can download it. And what this does is it takes your file and syncs up the video and the audio and gives you something that an editing tool can use. It probably takes, um, 
I would say pretty close to uh, uh, 20, 30 minutes, but you absolutely need to do this, and it's a step that's important to make you uh, able to take the next step, which is to airbrush out imperfections or to take and make uh, or take certain parts of your webinar and uh, use it for another purpose. And if you, if you look at your screen here, what we have is you, you take that encoded file, you import it, it becomes what's known as a project, and then down here it lays out the audio track. And sometimes there is echoes, sometimes there could be clipping, clicking, sometimes you could have one speaker whose, whose uh, voice is a lot stronger than the others, and in fact you can see that on here, this is a stronger uh, speaker than this one here. It gives you little tools to even it out, and it's just a nice way uh, to, to be able to have a, a crisper uh, a production and recording to share with people. And the other thing you can do too is, for people in an on-demand setting, they don't want to sit through housekeeping instructions and people waiting for time to vote on a poll. You can edit that out, edit out anything else that you don't need. So there's many, many tools to use. We use Camtasia. Mike, what are some of your favorites? Uh, I actually, I love Camtasia. Camtasia is a tool that uh, enables you to do a lot of powerful internet audio and video functions. But I use, uh, I, uh, I'm very familiar with Sony products. I, I've been uh, around television and radio for over 30 years and Sony has just been uh, uh, very much a powerhouse in broadcast and video and audio. And so Sony Movie Studio uh, is just a, an incredibly powerful video editing tool. And so when I do webinars with, with Citrix, I will save them as the WMV, which is Windows Media, Windows Media Video, and that file, the audio and the screen uh, video will come right into Sony Movie Studio, and I can I, do the same things you're talking about, edit out parts that were mistakes. In fact, I had a webinar one time where we were doing a live demo, and the demo, uh, the website was down. So, you know, here we're in a live situation, and all we can do is say, well, folks, it really works, so come back and watch the replay, and we'll, we'll re-record it when it's working and show you. So I was able to edit it when the website came back up, insert it into the webinar that was live, and make a perfect recap. So post-production editing will allow you to fix things that are beyond your control and also enhance things, uh, adding music, adding transitions, uh, and, and then being able to repurpose that content in a multitude of ways. So Sony Movie Studio is my high recommendation. I own Camtasia, I own Sony Movie Studio, and I use them every day in my business. Thanks, Mike. And then, now we want to distribute the uh, information. There's a couple ways to do it. In fact, there's more than a couple ways. In, in our business, we upload it to a portal uh, by GoToWebinar. And the advantage of that is we can then send out the link to anybody in the audience for them to have an on-demand viewing. And when they do have an on-demand viewing, it allows us to know who looked at the recording. So if you're doing demand generation or if you're looking for how, what type of buzz there was after your webinar, it's very easy to track. I mentioned this earlier. Another thing to do is to edit out sound bites. And you can take particular parts of that webinar and use that uh, to reinforce your message with clients and prospects. Another great uh, way of using uh, some of the recording is to post portions. Uh, you can post it on YouTube uh, for your website. And Mike, this is uh, one of the ones that, that you use a lot of, is with uh, MP4 streaming video of Amazon S3. Exactly. Uh, MPEG-4 is a video format that's very popular. It looks really good on the Internet. It's a streaming video format that anybody can do. And Amazon, the people that sell the books, has got a, uh, a storage, a file storage uh, system that's just dirt cheap. And lots of businesses, corporations, all kinds of people, anybody in the world can get an Amazon S3 account and be able to share video for very, very little money. And so uh, one of my ways of repurposing my webinars is putting them up in that format on Amazon S3. And some of it is premium content that I sell, and some of it is content that I give away to build relationships. And, and one that we don't have a, uh, a bullet point, but I do want to mention, is I will take webinar content and I can turn them into DVDs that I uh, uh, take to uh, uh, conventions, trade shows, or even if I'm working one-on-one -on -one with clients. So uh, the ability to take this content and repurpose it in a multitude of ways to get the message out and help, you know, you do it once and you get to repurpose it. You really almost get almost as much, if not more, benefit from the recording that you do from the live event. But the live event keep, holds you accountable to get it done. I, I don't know how 
I know that I'm a human being, that I'm part of the, na the nation that Willie Jolly says don't be a part of, the procrastination. And so <laughs> I don't want to, pro it keeps me from procrastinating. I get, when I schedule a webinar, I'm going to get killer content that I can repurpose. Well, let's perfect segue to talk about, at a very high level, what we consider to be 10 best practices for delivering quality webinar audio. And again, all of these could be a, a full day webinar. Just to review some of the things we've talked about, because we want to move into taking your questions, and we have one more section on doing the sound check and why that's so important for eliminating glitches. But as we've said, the tone of your voice and smile is extremely important. That's how you connect with your audience, is having a strong voice. Thinking like a broadcaster, as Mike said, using a professional USB microphone. And again, make sure you invest in today's fastest PCs and use something like SpeedNet or Speakeasy to make sure your download speeds are there. There's a lot of moving parts in doing a webinar. All of these are critical to making sure that you get the best quality. Also, your environmental considerations to make sure that uh, cell phones are turned off and, and you don't have a cell phone too close to your computer. That can often get picked up. An area that I think is extremely important is to practice, test, practice, test. Uh, you cannot practice enough, and I don't mean to sound scripted or rehearsed, but just to get comfortable with what you're doing and make sure that everything works. Another thing is have a soft copy printout of your slides available. If you're using PowerPoint, print it out in notes page view. You always need to have a plan B because glitches can and will happen. In fact, Mike, I think it's interesting this morning, um, if you don't mind sharing with the audience what, what, what you experienced as you were logging on for, uh, for today's webinar. Well, <laughs> I have another studio here in the house uh, that's on a DSL connection. And uh, about five minutes before I was supposed to log on and get with, with the group here today, it, it locked up. It would, there was no connection. The, it, the DSL was down. And I have two internet connections here in the house, so I had to move move my microphone out of my studio and reset up another computer here in another room that was on a, uh, a Comcast cable c connection. And and that's the thing is that why you had had we waited till two minutes before we would have started ten minutes late because I had to start I you know had to had to go okay I have a problem what am I going to do because that glitch was beyond my control. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that that's one of the reasons I always have, have two Internet connections, because if one's down, hopefully both, both of them won't be down. And I'm sure the DSL is back up right now, but I didn't want to take a chance, and that's why I, I opted to uh, uh, think of a, another way to get around it. So we had a glitch. You know, I, I've gone months without ever having a problem with that connection. And today, the most important webinar about audio that I've done in years, and I had a glitch. But, you know, it, hey, it gave us a story to talk about. And a, abs, actually, that's probably one of the most important things. I know a lot of the folks in the audience wanted to know, how do you avoid glitches? What we absolutely believe in is the sound check. And you always want to do this one hour before going live. And the reason is Mike's story just, uh, it, you know, gave a perfect example of what can happen. It, there's pressure in doing a webinar. There's last-minute things, and the more things that go wrong and the less time you have to do it and the more pressure and the more likely it is is to make a mistake. So give yourself an hour to test it. If everything is, is cool, no problem. Always start by rebooting your PC or Mac. That's just a given. And if you are a user of GoToMeeting or GoToWebinar, there's a free software program called GoToMeeting Wizard and you can get it on their website. And what it does is it optimizes your internet connection. I run it every time after I reboot. Then make sure if you have Internet Messenger it's turned off, all your pop-ups are turned off, and any non-essential applications are not in use. There's nothing worse than having your uh, uh, Outlook pop up until you have a meeting in 15 minutes. Another important point in doing the sound check is validate with your presenters. Remember, a lot of your presenters, they have a day job. Their, their job is not being a webinar presenter. Make sure that when they've logged in that they've chosen uh, voice over IP or telephone and if there's a mute code that they've, that they've entered it. Sometimes if there is a serious problem and they don't enter their mute code, there's no way of being able to mute them if there's a problem uh, with their particular connection. I put this last one in, in caps. Please, no open PC mics and speakers uh, or mobile or wireless phones. You are guaranteed and asking for, for problems. We've had situations where 
we've had presenters, even after we've told them, they will try to talk through an open mic and a PC. And we usually try to get that done in, in the dress rehearsals, but that will just cause uncontrollable uh, echo. Mobile devices, sound tinny. You heard me on the headset before, or wireless phones. We had a situation where somebody used a wireless phone and the battery went out. So please, move away from that and, and no speaker phones too. Again, when you're starting one hour before going live, test. And have each of your presenters and each of your panelists speak. Make sure they're loud and clear. Make sure they have a clean connection. Another thing I recommend is stress test each one of your cables. And what I mean by that is if somebody is speaking with a, with a microphone or if they're speaking with a handset, have them move around and move the cables around to make sure that there's no uh, um, weakness in the cable, that there's no interference, that you're not going to hear a, a bad electrical connection. And then again, if you're on a system such as this where you have uh, panelists and organizers who are not speaking but they're in a subconference mode, make sure you've muted them before you go live. And then I always recommend you launch your splash screen, as we did here 20 minutes prior to going live. And the reason that you want to do that is because in the unlikely event that there's a problem in launching it, you want to be able to restart and get out. Sometimes you'll get errors, and it's just much better to do that 15 or 20 minutes before you go live than when you have people on and you have to restart it. And then start as close to you as you can on time, select record, use your best broadcaster voice, welcome your audience, and have fun. The most important thing is to have fun with this, is, is to convey your interest and your enthusiasm. So we've covered off on quite a few topics here. We have quite a few questions. Some of them are on these topics. We're going to get to them in just a moment. What we want to let you know is that for more information and resources, uh, you can go to the WebAttract website. We have on-demand videos of many of our, of our, our webinars. Uh, we have best practice videos. We have case studies and white papers. Feel free to go there. It's very content rich. You can, you can speak with either myself or my co-principal, Brett Smith. There's our numbers. And also, we're very excited that on August 4th, we've been uh, selected by Citrix, who is the uh, developer of GoToWebinar to be their featured guest on an upcoming webinar called Start to Finish, How to Run a Great Webinar. So uh, we'd love to see you on that one. And when we send out the uh, thank you emails, we'll put a link in there for that too. How to get a hold of Mike Stewart, there's his phone number and his various uh, um, email addresses. And as we said, for a free download and for a link to his book, and we just touched the surface on it, the book on Internet Audio, there's the URL at the bottom there, too. We'll send that to you as well. Mike, I want to now move into starting to take some of the questions that we have here from uh, the folks in the audience. And the first one I have here is, this is from Amanda. I, I would like to know how to avoid echoes on GoToWebinar. Uh, I think we, we did mention that. You want to make sure that you're using everything to not have an open uh, sound circuit. Uh, feedback is the result of a microphone picking up its speakers and also making sure that all attendees are muted. Uh, when you have uh, all of the attendees with their phones or their microphones on to where you, you've got all these multitudes of sound inputs, that's what's going to create the echoes. So no open mics, no uh, uh, speakers uh, off if you can. Um, you know, the fact, the reason I'm using headphones today is so that there's no live speakers here. I know that you're doing, uh, doing, you've got your speakers very low. Um, and so when you, when you have all that control in place, that's going to eliminate the echoes. And it's just, it, it, the echoes are from the fact that a microphone is picking up an open speaker or a telephone. So just make sure everything is closed and everything is muted as possible and you should have clean audio. Okay, here's a question from Wes. For GoToWebinar, do you pre-upload the presentation or can you run it directly from your PC? We don't pre-upload. We run it live. Uh, there are some, some people who want to do what they call Simulive. Everything is done live uh, in, in, in doing that. And then uh, there's a question here uh, for, for you. Uh, this is from Shelley. Uh, Mike on speeds, is this for the host and presenters or does it apply to the audience on those speed tests that we, uh, we gave before? Everybody's speed matters. If you've, got, you know, if you've got an attendee who has a very poor connection, there's nothing you can do about it. In fact, 
if you if you give it uh, equate it to television, you know, when I was a kid, there was a television station that we wanted to watch so bad, but it was 150 miles away. So we used to watch it with lots of snow and poor, and it would fade in and out because it was just so far away. We couldn't get good reception. That was not the transmission's fault. That was the receiving fault. Was we had distance was our disconnect. So. I would recommend, you know, maybe have a tutorial or something or just tell people to make sure that they're on a stable connection, that there's not, you know, people robbing their connection speed by doing things. You, you know, when you're watching a webinar, don't have your email open. Don't have things that will c connect to the Internet. Uh, I've actually had people doing a webinar trying to watch uh, streaming video while, you know, and not paying attention to the webinar, and then, you know, they would have glitches because of that. So basically, uh, until... Internet uh, connections become very, very, very fast and very, very, very stable. You need to do everything you can to ensure everybody has a good experience. Mike, here's a here's a technical question: Should the microphone be omnidirectional? Maybe you want to explain that. Uh, no, I the, the microphone omnidirectional means that the full 360 circumference of the microphone is picking up sound, and that's what will when why that's why we use cardioid pattern microphones. Uh, meaning it's a heart-shaped pickup pattern. The back of the microphone doesn't pick up. Uh, it's pretty much half as much. It, it's not completely silent, but it's not picking up fully directional like uh, like an omnidirectional microphone. So omni means it's picking up from all directions. Cardioid means it's picking up in a heart-shaped pattern, meaning the basis of the pickup sound. So you want to uh, you want to use a microphone that is uh, uh, like we're using right now, which is a cardioid pattern, not omnidirectional. Here's, here's one from Carolyn. If you're doing a demonstration video with, if, you, if you're doing a demonstration video with audio, which microphone should you use that allows you to walk around and doesn't distract the viewer? Uh, I assume that when you mean demonstration video, you know, see this is one of the people sometimes get screen sharing and screen capture video confused with full motion video. If you and so I guess that's what you mean is that if you're walking around in a webinar, there should be no walking around. There's no reason to walk around because the screen is not uh, is not showing anything of that kind of motion. However, if you're walking around a, on a stage as a presenter, you would use a high quality lavalier microphone that's clipped to your clothing, uh, which is very close to your speaking voice, and then the camera is following you. So you got to differentiate between full motion video and screen capture video. And webinars are just dealing with screen capture video, so there there's no walking around, and that shouldn't. That's, I think that's the only way that I could answer that. Okay. Here's, a, here's a question from David, and I'm not sure if, if it came in earlier in, in, the, in the webinar, but is there a quality difference between the headset versus a standalone $30 directional mic? Uh, I, don't know, I don't know that many good $30 directional mics because basically that's probably of the same quality as a headset microphone. Once again, there's uh, when you go to uh, audio microphone manufacturers, they usually have consumer divisions and they have pro audio divisions. And so uh, there is going to be a difference between consumer audio and pro audio. So when it, whatever you get when you're doing webinars, consider owning pro audio equipment and make sure that, you know, that you're t you know talking with somebody that is you know, selling you the difference and, and, and an expert at the difference and providing you pro audio equipment versus consumer audio. I, I don't know of any good pro audio microphones for $30, whereas if an office supply place has it, it's probably a consumer audio microphone. If it's at a consumer electronics, it's probably a consumer microphone. Here's, here's, a, couple, here's a pair of questions from Murray. Uh, the first one is, what microphone do you recommend? And the second part is, do we need an external sound card to get good sound quality? Uh, well, the microphone that just keeps it simple for my customers, even though there's literally hundreds of great choices varying in price from, you know, $80 to $8,000. Uh, you don't need an $8,000 or $10,000 microphone, even though, uh, you know, a famous musician would want to make sure that the studio had the $10,000 microphone. I use the Audio-Technica, and in fact, I'm an Audio-Technica dealer, and in fact, that's what I recommended to Mike and a WebAttract, is to get the Audio-Technica 2020, which is, uh, you, at my reference there, go to Recording Tools. You can see a picture of it and, and see that that's what I recommend. You know, knowing how to use a microphone is what my business is. It's not saying, oh, which microphone do you want? I just know that you need to get a large diaphragm, 
condenser USB microphone, and they work for a multitude of uses. And in fact, in my free book, the book on Internet audio, I talk about 20 things to do with a microphone other than webinars, because owning a microphone is really a powerful communication tool for business over the Internet. And then and you don't need, oh, I'm sorry. No, you go ahead. Question. Well, I, I, and the microphone is its own sound card, so you don't need another sound card. That's what happened when they started making USB microphones. It eliminated the, the need for a professional sound card because the sound cards that came in computers would not allow you to hook up pro-quality audio equipment. And so you had to have the, the traditional analog microphone, and then you had to have some sort of interface that would allow you to hook up to the, to the computer. Well, the USB microphone eliminated that second piece of equipment. And that actually is a question that Shelley had. Just clarify it. Um, the question is, with with the device you're using, is is it also a, a USB or a normal stereo jack? Well, in, in the case that I'm using right here, is the microphone does not have playback capability. The microphone is USB, but I'm using I plug my uh, stereo headphones, just like headphones that you plug into your iPod or your uh, any portable playback device. Just regular headphones. You could actually use iPod earbuds if you wanted to, because you have what's called an eighth-inch jack in most laptops and computers, and so that if you set go to webinar to play the audio back on one on your internal sound card, but you use your recording device to be your USB microphone, you get, you, you, in fact, you're putting the heavy lifting of recording on your microphone and the heavy lifting of playback on another device, and my headphones are just normal. I could unplug these headphones, plug them right into another device that had an eighth inch jack. So it's not a headset microphone, it's a microphone and headphones. Well, Michael, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and I want to thank everybody in the audience because I know we have uh, we're approaching the end of the hour and we want to respect everybody's time any final comments you have before I give them some additional information well you know I think it all stems back to looking at the human factor the technical factors and the equipment factors um, you know we came together Mike because uh, you taught me that that there's a lot of people who just they need your services of helping this be successful they don't want to learn all the moving parts I've stolen that word from you several times my moving parts I've never heard that before until I met you and and that's but there are some people that in my world do want to know what are the tools what are, just like you you were the the person who said what's the equipment what do I need to do to improve our audio because you were being successful but there were a couple of things that we filled in the gaps for you so what I want to leave people is if you're the type of person who wants to know how how it works and how you can do some of these things yourself I'm a solution for that and then if you're a person but regardless doing webinars is an incredible way to save travel time gasoline uh, standing in line at airports hotels I mean I love the fact that I can get together with friends share what I love and my passions and be in the comfort of my home so uh, or at my office wherever it is I want to be so webinars is a great powerful tool that didn't exist just a few years ago and now it does and so few people don't know how to maximize it so that's what that's our mission is to help people understand the power of webinars and how to make them better well I thank you so much I and to all of you in the audience, we really, really appreciate your time and, and, and your attention. We hope you got the value that you came for. And if you'll be kind enough to fill out the brief survey, that will give us a lot of insight on what are the other topics you'd like, what else you'd like to learn. We've tried to answer just about all the questions. I think there's a few here we didn't get to. We promise to get to you offline. Again, you'll get a copy with the link to this uh, rec uh, recording and uh, the additional information for follow-up. On behalf of uh, Mike Stewart, the Internet Audio Guy, and the rest of us at WebAttract, thanks so much for joining us. Have a great rest of the week, and bye for now.